Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered, the podcast that lifts the veil, shrouding the mystery behind the adult industry. And today I have a really special guest to talk about a lot of mystery and a lot of conjecture around one of the adult industry's biggest brands of all time. She is the new face and first female forward-facing executive of a brand that you all know and love, I hope, Pornhub. At least you definitely know it, that's for sure. <laughs> um, last year, she became the first female executive of Pornhub. Um, she was tapped to the head of community and brand. She's behind tons of great work that Pornhub is doing right now. And all, as always, she is leading the fight against all forms of discrimination that sex workers face. Welcome, Alex Kakesi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please tell me I said your last name correctly. You did. Yeah, I nailed it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes no, I, it happen. trips up everybody. I don't know why people want to always put like an extra K. Yeah, they want to do Kikeski, which mm. is very cute. But hmm. damn, so you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. I actually my actual last name because Randall's technically my middle name. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a K in there that's silent, and boy, oh boy, does that throw oh, yeah. people off. Well, I mean, it's a hung. If we want to get into it, it's a Hungarian last name, mm. and it's technically Kikashi. But I'm not gonna. Put that yeah. on you. <laughs> that's like that's a, I said it once. I got it right. Kakesi is great. I can say Alex. Yeah. That I can get. <laughs> All right. So Alex, um, mm -hmm. let's start off by you explaining to us what your role is as the head of community and brand at Pornhub. Sure. Um, so head of community and brand, it's a new position in the company. Well, I guess a year now um, was a new position when I took it on. I'm the first person to fill the role. Um, basically we saw a real need to develop a bridge in a meaningful and visible way between sort of like the corporate side of the porn world and the community. Um, so that is me and my team. Um, obviously like as Pornhub being like a creator uh, driven platform, this is, you know, a, a relationship that's existed in um, many different sort of iterations behind the scenes for a very long time. Like it's obviously we've had people directly communicating with creators for years and years at this point. Um, but I think from a public facing side, that's never something that ALO um, or Pornhub certainly has ever had. So um, what that looks like in practice or an application is mostly um, doing stuff like this, which I love to do. Um, helping people better understand sort of what the brand is, what the site is. A lot of people actually don't understand what Pornhub is hmm. or how it works. Like they know the, I guess like the brand name, but we still get questions all the time like, oh, when are you guys doing a casting? And it's like, we don't make content. It's a, it's a user generated content platform. Um, and then also trying now, especially uh, more than ever, trying to help people really understand what we're about from a trust and safety perspective. So just really helping people understand um, how safe Pornhub is, all the different measures that we have in place to really keep the platform safe, um, both from the viewer side so that people can feel confident that when they're going on Pornhub and they're watching content, that that's all content that's been vetted um, by our moderation process. And then from a creator side that like they can feel good about putting content on a site similarly that has a lot of these safety checkpoints in place. Um, I've also really been enjoying going to the different industry events. So expos, ABN, that kind of stuff. We've been doing workshops there. Um, and those have been really interesting. I really wasn't sure what to expect, even though I've, I've been with the company for um, almost 11 years at this point. So I've obviously, you know, interfaced with, with tons of people sort of behind the scenes, but in this different way, kind of going in um, and doing workshops with creators and really being like, okay, we're kind of just here and we want to just communicate with you and hear what it is that you're experiencing on the site. How can we be doing things better? Um, what are some of the pain points? But then also trying to help people understand, um, you know, some of the stuff that we have to offer that they might not be familiar with. So it's very much focused on um, helping creators succeed as much as possible and make the most money possible using Pornhub. Awesome. Yeah. So what are these things that you offer that people may not be aware of? Like, tell us about the different iterations of Pornhub besides like yeah. just the free porn. Yeah. So that's, um, I think there's like a big misconception that free porn makes, means no one's making money. Um, I get that question all the time. So do I. How do you make money? Mm -hmm. How does anyone make money when all porn is online for free? 
So it's ad revenue. Um, Pornhub obviously has a lot of advertising space on the site. Um, so the way that we're able to pay creators when they're uploading content to the site is they get a portion of the ad revenue. So that obviously is impacted by, you know, views, engagement, that kind of thing. Um, but we do have a team in place that's led by my colleague, Santa, who's with me at a bunch of the different events. Um, and we, we work with people to help them optimize basically. So sometimes that means, you know, getting on a call with someone really like doing like an almost like forensic kind of evaluation of their content and just pointing out things that might seem, you know, like very easy to miss or that people aren't necessarily thinking of when they're um, titling their work or when they're they're labeling certain things with um, with tags or the way that they're categorizing stuff. There's little things that you can do um, really strategically that make a huge difference and that can work to your favor just to help get stuff in front of more people, which then obviously stands to positively impact um, the way that you get paid. Right, which is exactly how YouTube works for the most exactly. part. Exactly, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook too, and yep. Instagram as well. Yep, all the platforms. So, uh, part of this role is being the first public-facing executive in Pornhub's history. Mm -hmm. um, were you apprehensive about being the face of a company that the public has such strong opinions of? That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, so. Obviously, I put a lot of thought into it before <laughs> before jumping in. Um, but without sounding too corny, I hope like I really I really do love what I do and I love this industry so much. Um, and I think it's, you know, one of the things that I know we're going to get to this a little bit later when we talk about um, the new ownership and what's kind of changed since um, they acquired the company a year ago. But part of that um, commitment, I guess, that they took on as part of the new ownership was this real commitment to transparency. And so with that came this level of accessibility and visibility that um, I'm part of. So my role was announced at the same time as the acquisition. Um, and that was one of the things that I was personally really excited about when, when I first met with them a couple of months before everything was made public. Um, because the other part of my role is that I'm, I'm very involved in the communications um, of the company, right? So anything sort of public facing uh, that looks like any time that we respond to media inquiries depend like on a wide variety of subjects, but also um, on a creative level. So anything that has to do with the brand, uh, that's all stuff that I get to work on with my team. And there's certain things about the way that we operate as a company or that we the way that we operate as a brand that I think um, we, we really needed someone to sort of be saying on the record to get have it like really land in a way that was meaningful so there's certain things that we've been trying to sort of impart to press for years or even to the wider community about the way that we um especially on the trust and safety stuff so the the moderation practices uh the vetting practices that we have with content we've been trying to kind of explain this to people for a really long time and i think now that we have people that can explain it. And in many cases, what we've been doing with um, with certain reporters lately is actually like physically walking them through the whole process. It's like a 40 minute presentation um, that shows exactly like the journey that someone has to go through to upload content to the site. So that begins with like verification and then all the different processes um, from a verification and moderation standpoint. So it's quite extensive. And I think now it's finally starting to land, which is really exciting. Like in a way, it's kind of bittersweet. I was talking about that with uh, someone on my team this morning where, you know, a lot of the stuff we've been messaging for years, but I think it just takes that next step and that kind of like personal walkthrough to get it really like cemented, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a journey. It's one that I've um, I've been actually really pleasantly surprised in a lot of ways um at the way that i've been received in the role so yeah i'm ultimately if i'm looking back from a year ago i think i made the right choice for sure awesome uh what are your biggest goals that you'd like to accomplish in this role Whew. um i think i touched on it a little bit earlier so it's i think as much as possible trying to continue bridging that gap between the sort of like two sides of the industry which i think is going to be ongoing um and i think that sort of like the KPIs or whatever, like the metrics of success for what that looks like are going to shift as the industry and as technology continues to evolve. Um, 
But I think for the most part right now, it's really just trying to help people understand that uh, Pornhub is a safe place to share content. It's a safe place to experience, um, you know, a wide variety of different kinds of content from a user perspective. Um, It's a safe place to explore your sexuality. And I think just as much as possible trying to help demystify, um, you know, the the porn industry. I think there's a lot that is still, there's a lot that's still really misunderstood. And I think you, you know, this probably better Mm -hmm. than anyone um, about, you know, the way that this industry works, who the people are that are working in it. um, And also like this, you know, we, we really do care about each other. Like it's a really great community. Um, and I think that, yeah, I just think there's a lot that needs to get sort of set straight on that front. Yeah. I yeah. can agree with you more. So tell me about your history with Pornhub. Mm-hmm. Like how did you first get your foot in that door? Um, I applied pretty much out of school. Um, I did a gender and sexuality studies, um, degree in university. So that was kind of where my like feminist awakening kind of happened. Um, And a lot actually of the subject matter that I studied when I was in school had to do with sex work and pornography. That was like the stuff that I really particularly gravitated towards and I found the most interesting. Um, What do you think that is? I think just like, I think to me, I think pornography and sex work are it's so interesting. Like to me, I think it's, and you know, people have different views on this, but I think that it's almost like the most radical thing that you can do. And it's like, to me, I find that just like very exciting. And I think that um, it's almost like this true reflection of like just true agency and freedom almost, because to me, it's like, if, if you can do that, like, I think it's just like without again like I don't want to be like oh they're so brave but to me it's just like I really think it's like it's so powerful and so beautiful um to express yourself and have that level of like beauty and vulnerability and creativity you know that you're able and willing to share that with the world and also to monetize it I think is just like an incredibly powerful and feminist act um And I think, you know, that's certainly not the experience of everybody. I know that. I think for some people it's, it's just a job and that's totally cool. Um, But that's been the expression of it that I've personally had shared with me by a lot of my friends in the industry. Um, So yeah, I think it's just like, it's fascinating. Um, It's so interesting. I mean, because I mean, obviously like I agree with everything that you're saying, (laughs) Uh, but you know, there's, I mean, you talk about how it's like, the most freeing, you know, and industry and, and having a lot of agency. Mm-hmm. And there's so many people who believe it's the opposite, know, right? Yes. That every single woman is being pushed into mm-hmm. it because uh, she's forced there by a boyfriend or a pimp or she has no other alternatives in her life. Mm-hmm. What do you say to people who push that view of porn and women in it? Look, I think that there is no singular experience of sex work. And I think anyone that's trying to sort of, you know, say that it's completely one or completely the other, I think that there is danger in both of those, right? Like, I think if you're saying like, oh, it's all flowers and roses and like everything's perfect and there's nothing ever bad that happens, I think that's denying the experience and lived reality of a lot of people. And there is definitely um, a fight that needs to be fought on that front, which is why we work with a lot of different um, anti-trafficking groups and a lot of, um, sex worker led advocacy groups so that we can tackle those appropriately. Right. Um, I will give a shout out to the cupcake girls here. They're, uh, one of our most recent partners and we're working specifically on resources with them, um, that we can disseminate in our community to show people like, okay, if you're getting into the industry, um, and you're starting to create content at home, like these are things that you want to do or not do to keep yourself safe, right? Can you briefly explain what the cupcakes are, yes. girls are to people who may not know? They are a Las Vegas-based um, sex work advocacy group. They have an emphasis on anti-trafficking. So they work really directly within the community. And it's a lot of, um, it's very, like one of the things I really like about them is that there are sex workers that are on their board. So like Charlotte Stokely yep. is their um, their chairwoman. And I think that that it's is such really, a great representative too. It's like chef's kiss. Perfect. Yeah. Like, and I think that that 
is what's so important, right? Because I think, you know, a lot of the groups that you're talking about um, are not necessarily platforming or involving voices from within the industry, be it, you know, if they had a great time while they were in the industry or a horrible time, I think it's really important that we're actually, you know, taking the accounts of people that have lived it and understand like where the actual pain points are and where the, the vulnerabilities are mm-hmm. so that we can go and support there in a real and meaning, meaningful way. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that's really phenomenal about the way that the Cupcake Girls work is that they have a we'll meet you where you're at kind of a uh, level of engagement with their clients. So there's never anything that's like, we're going to try and really push you to do this if you're not ready or trying to, you know, necessarily um, like there's no like forcing people to do anything or there's, there's no, no agenda. Exactly. And yeah. there's no like, oh, we're only going to help you if you agreed to do X, Y, Z, because they appreciate and understand that people, especially that are in more vulnerable situations, like support for people looks really different on an even individual level, but also on a given day. Mm-hmm. Um so they come in, meet people where they're at, and help them directly with what it is that they need. So, so how would the Cupcake Girls be different from like someone like Nikosi? Who? <laughs> Which is another anti-trafficking program. Um, hmm. Well, I don't think Nikosi have any sex workers on their board. And if they do, they're probably people who've had a bad experience. They're yeah. They're uh, they're. They're funded by like a religious right background, right? Yeah. They used to be called uh, morality in media. Mm. Um, That's a familiar term for my parents' day. Mm-hmm. It's a, It was a, I will give them props. Whoever did that rebranding is top notch. Yep. Um, but yes, they used to be called morality in media. They're the reason why I, as far as I know, I think we don't have like Cosmo magazine and like the checkout at like Walmart or something mm-hmm. like that. They've, um, you know, it's it's a lot of just like anti-sex. And I think that that is really like what the agenda is there ultimately with a lot of um, alleged anti-trafficking groups is that it's a really convenient sort of veil or facade for groups that are just really actually trying to eradicate um, all kinds of sex work, like legal or otherwise. So I think that would be the big the big yeah. difference. Yeah. I mean, and this is something that I come across in people who are not in the adult industry or who are not like well educated yeah. in that sector. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, but they're anti trafficking. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that is like the sexy facade that they put up. Yeah. Because like, look, like no one's again no one's for trafficking. No, certainly not. And especially like if you throw a child in there. Like no like that's an easy thing on the surface to get behind. Like yeah. we don't want to force anyone into sex work. Mm-hmm. But then it really kind of becomes this situation where they believe that everybody in sex work was trafficked. You know, like there's so many yeah. people that think that there's not a single woman, especially because women can't make up their own minds and they're not actually yeah. inherently <laughs> sexual people or exhibitionists. They're like <laughs> they must be there because someone made them. Yeah. You know, and it's that whole idea that like everybody in this industry is broken and forced in there by yeah. circumstances that, you know, are out of their control and we must save them all. Mm-hmm. Whereas it sounds like, well, as I know, the Cupcake Girls, it's more of like, yes, there are people that have been pushed into situations that is not favorable for them specifically. Yep. How can we like help you mitigate mm-hmm. your circumstances, you know, get you out, get you in a better situation? Yeah. Like what, like treating each person as the individual that they are with yeah. their individual needs that they have exactly. rather than blanketing everybody as a victim. I think that's actually a great way to put it because it's, if, if we want to just say like, what's the main difference? I would say that their approach is one of harm reduction first yeah. and foremost, right? Whereas the other, it's like, it's not. What they want to do is push dangerous laws that are making sex work um, more dangerous for everybody. Like we all saw, well, we all saw, I think the industry saw, um, very directly what the sort of, uh, result of FOSTA SESTA was. And I think we're unfortunately facing a lot of that again right now with the age verification laws that are coming into effect. Uh, there's new states every day that are signing bills that are very ill-conceived. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that's, what's really frustrating about it is that, People, I think, are very well intentioned when it comes to engaging in anti-trafficking discourse. And like you said, there's no one in the, especially in the porn industry, more than anybody, I think, 
um, wants to see trafficking eradicated. Like it's it's so dangerous for for our industry, especially for that exact reason, because it's used as um, this like almost like stand in term for sex work. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a huge conflation. Um, but I think when people better understand and are able to like really separate the two things where there is trafficking on one side and sex work on the other, like there is no like Venn diagram where these things overlap mm-hmm. um, in terms of like consensual sex work. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's like one thing also in my role that I would really like to try and help people better understand. Yeah. And I think that the most frustrating thing about it is, you know, the mainstream media is always going to latch on to mm-hmm. the, you know, anti sex trafficking, you know, agenda that is like all sex work is trafficking work because yeah. it feeds into that narrative that, you know, we've been raised with mm-hmm. that, you know, porn is bad and, you know, um, uh, loose women are bad. Women who enjoy sexuality are bad. Women who, you know, um, monetize sexuality mm-hmm. or bad. Mm-hmm. And so that's an, that's an easy message to get across that is easily digestible from by the general public. The harder message to get across is like, actually, wait, like, for a woman who enjoys sex and who yeah. really like this job. And it's been the, the career path that was the most suited for them. And they've had the most amount of success mm-hmm. and it's brought them the most freedom. And, you know, even women... I mean, I've had women on. I remember Adria Ray was a really great interview where she talked mm-hmm. about like she'd had traumatic experiences with sex and she was able to come into the porn industry and like reimagine those experiences. And porn was like therapy for her. Yeah. You know, she was able to like explore situations in a controlled environment where she felt safe and mm-hmm. she felt like she was with people that she trusted mm-hmm. and there was accountability and there was other people there and it was really helpful for her to sort yeah. through those previously traumatic sexual experiences and that was such an interesting because I had never I mean for me myself I've never I've been so privileged to never have experienced any kind of like sexual trauma or mm-hmm. abuse or physical abuse or anything I had like a very like like lovely childhood raised by pornographers imagine that um <laughs> so it was really interesting for me to hear that directly from the mouths of a se- yeah. mouth of a sex worker and how porn can be so different for different people i've heard the I love that from a number of different creators yeah. actually where it's just, and it makes perfect sense right because mm-hmm. it's like everything is i mean if you're if you're operating um a solid studio right or you're doing if you're creating porn ethically um which is another term that i think it's misused quite a bit um, you know, I think that people are negotiating all this stuff like before you actually start, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is these are all conversations that are happening directly, like with the people that you're going to be working with, but also with the crew, um, so that people know, like, okay, this is what we're getting into. These are the acts that we will or will not be doing. These are things that are and are not okay. And it's just like, imagine if we actually all did that, like mm-hmm. in our day to day lives. Like, yeah. Wow. If we actually communicated about our yeses and nos yeah. and had boundary checklists. I know. And, like, imagine. Crazy. <laughs> you would think that like people could actually learn from yeah. the porn industry. Yeah. Yes. Imagine Mm -hmm. that. I know. (laughs) All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break and then when we're going to come back, we're going to talk about um, these, this new legislation that's come up that's um, threatening the adult industry and um, the ramifications that it means for sex work in general. So stick around. We'll be right back. Hello, my amazing listeners. You know how much I love bringing this podcast to your ears every week. So if you're looking a way to support the show and get some fantastic perks, I've got just the thing, my Patreon page. With plans starting at just $5 a month, you can be part of our exclusive community. Your support not only helps to keep this podcast going, but it also unlocks some really cool bonuses. Imagine getting access to the live streams of my interviews as they happen. You'll be right in the middle of the action, seeing all of the unedited moments. But that's not all. As a Patreon member, you'll also get exclusive bonus content. I'm talking extra mini episodes where our guests answer questions submitted by you. Plus, you'll have access to my fine art photography and behind the scenes videos, giving you a sneak peek into my creative process. And guess what? If you opt for a discounted year-long membership, you'll save even more while supporting the show. Longtime subscribers even get free HRU merchandise as a token of my gratitude. So want to join us? 
head over to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered and become a part of our growing community. Your support means the world to me. Let's make this podcast even better. All right, everybody, we are back. So Alex, I want to talk about kind of the article, I guess, that sort of started this all, this whole media mm-hmm. storm. Um, and that would be the New York Times article, mm-hmm. uh, The Children of Pornhub, I think it was called, mm-hmm. written by Nicholas Kristof. A lot of people don't know about this and they don't know about like this backstory that's kind of like led you guys to the place that you are today. Can you mm-hmm. just tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So um, there were a lot of changes that we were already actively working on or a lot of updates that we were making to our compliance practices that were in the works uh, well before that article got published. Um, I think that oof, it's a it's a tricky one to talk about. Um, I think that like there are a number. So, yeah, there's a number of things that I want to address, I guess, mm-hmm. with respect to that article. Um, I think the biggest one is that I would really encourage people to look at people at the way that Pornhub is operating today Mm -hmm. um, and sort of what that evolution has looked like as well. Um, We have this extremely robust um, trust and safety protocol now where it is impossible to upload content to the site unless you're verified. So that means you have to go through a whole process where you have to show your government ID. um, You have to do a likeness scan to make sure that like you are actually the person that is on the ID. Um, before you can even create an account on Pornhub to upload content. And then when you want to upload content, there's, again, like this very extensive process that you have to go through um, where the piece of content itself gets scanned by a number of different databases where it's looking for things like, is this known copyrighted content? Is this known CSAM? Is this known um, other types of illegal content? Like, you name it, it's, it's scanned against those databases. And then it undergoes a final step of human revision. So, like, an actual human being has to look at the content and approve it before it goes online. So I think that we've done a really good job in terms of getting to a place today where that system is really, really good. I think it's the best that it could be today. Does that mean it's going to be the same in five years? Like, absolutely not. Like, we're going to continue to evolve it um, as better products get made available or as new concerns, you know, inevitably arise. Um, So yeah, I think that today I'm really, really proud of where we're at and the the sort of state of things on that level. Yeah. Yeah. I've personally seen like such a massive change happen at what is now. So it's it's ALO, A-Lo. not ALU. Because some people are like ALU no, and A-Lo. A-Lo. Okay, yeah. ALO. A-Lo. Because it was MindGeek. Yep. Now it's ALO. Um, yeah. So I've personally, you know, been with the brand for like 12 years, mm-hmm. whatever they bought out Twisties. Um, and you know, I've seen like massive changes in the way that that brand operates and Mm -hmm. it's been overwhelmingly positive. And I've had a lot of girls come on here who are like browsers, contract girls and be like, they're the best. They treat me the best. Mm -hmm. It's the contract that everybody wants to have. And so, you know, I just want to say that, like, I commend you guys immensely on, on those changes. And it's been really amazing thing to see. And, you know, proud to be like associated with a brand like that thank you that's so nice to hear for real because like that's you know i guess um one of the things i get the most in my in my role just from like you know people from outside the industry is they they'll send me an article that they see where it's like oh did you hear about this thing i'm like well first of all yes i'm the head of brand like i did hear about this article Mm -hmm. thank you so much for bringing it to my attention um but at this point like yeah for me it's kind of it's so easy to explain just like we are I think, you know, in the process of if not having already set what is the gold standard when it comes to trust and safety, not just for um, adult content, but I think like user user generated content in general, Um, like I don't know of a single other platform that or at least a free platform, certainly that does things the way that we do. Yeah. Yeah. I would say like probably one of the most damaging accusations that I've seen out there is that, you know, Pornhub has profited off of like... um, see Sam. And I would say in, you know, and I always try to counter with like, well, that the model of mm-hmm. Pornhub, like all other platforms, like the one that you're watching on right now, mm-hmm. YouTube is literally like a profit model in terms of like you profit off of content uploaded. But mm-hmm. it's so I think important to stress that it's a content, a user upload site. Yep. So like that's the automatic way that the site works, mm-hmm. but it was never like an intentional 
move. But this is why we have those systems in place, right? Is right. Specifically prevent that. Like we do not want that content on our no. site. Like it is absolutely prohibited um, in all of our terms of serve, like our, you know, whichever one of our guidelines, terms of use that you want to look at, it is like a complete no. Um, we, you know, we, we have partnerships with different um, child protection groups to that end as well. Like we actually did um, this really great one that I'm really, really proud of that came out, um, or it's been, I guess, in a pilot project uh, for about a year now, but it's been in the works long before then with the IWF and the Lucy Faithful Foundation, mm -hmm. where we, um, so those are two groups that are based in the UK. Uh, IWF is the Internet Watch Foundation, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I shouldn't just use acronyms and assume know. that everyone knows. We tend to fall into that like <laughs> porn know, vernacular. We're like, everybody that. knows what we're talking about. Yeah, and it's like, no, I should explain what that is. But they're an incredibly important group um, that essentially does, um, you know, they, they work specifically on keeping children safe online. And it's, you know, it's, it's not just about the pornography industry. Like, this is like internet wide. Mm -hmm. um, and we did a partnership with them which is a deterrence-based um, initiative, essentially. So if someone in the UK tries to search for a number of different terms that are associated with CSAM, they would get this, um, which, which we called a chat bot that would pop up um, and it would, <clears throat> sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of water. While you do that, I'm gonna explain to people because CSAM, another acronym that we're throwing out, it's a oh, right. child sexual Abuse material. Abuse material, right. I forgot the A, mm -hmm. just so you know. Okay. Um, so basically, yeah, we worked with um, these two groups and created an extensive list of different words that we would anticipate that someone would try and use to look for that content, which is not found on Pornhub. Um, but obviously we can't control what people are physically typing in, right, when mm -hmm. they're searching for it. So what would happen is if they're searching for this content, they put in one of those terms, um, they would get, first of all, our standard deterrence messaging, which lets the user know, like, there's much better language. I don't know it off the top of my head, but basically it's like you're, you know, just so you know that you're looking for content that is incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly illegal. Um, here's support. So this is where the chat bot came in, which is where it would actually um, link to the Lucy Faithful Foundation and just be like, hey, we saw that you were looking for this kind of content. like." You know, there's help that's available by way of the Lucy Faithful Foundation um, that actually does offer support to folks on that level. And um, the report actually got published recently and showed that there were like, as a result of this initiative, like people that actually came in and got treatment um, for that, which I think is pretty incredible. So these are people who are looking for CSAM, yeah. right? Which they're not finding on Pornhub to be extremely right, clear. right, right, right. Yes, yes, but, yes. <laughs> yeah. But we're looking for it, and so we're using that as like so rather than so rather than coming back and saying like you're a disgusting yeah. person and you should die. Yeah. Here are resources to help you with what is a condition that is like obviously very bad. Yeah. I'm very trying to think of like a like a better way to. Yeah, like, it has serious potential. Yes. Like I don't want to gloss over it. Like yes, there's yeah. serious potential for people, kids to get harmed as a result of yeah. these compulsions, for yeah. sure, which is why, you know, we're trying to support on that level to prevent. It's again, it's harm prevention, harm reduction. Yeah. How can we do that? And we saw great success with that. So it's really awesome when we're able to partner with groups like that, that see that there is potential in us working together as opposed to being like on completely opposite sides mm -hmm. um, of the spectrum. Like people like I think sometimes get really surprised when they hear that we work with different child protection groups. But for us, that's no, it's a no brainer. Like that is like so top of mind to us. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't want that content on our site from like certainly a moral perspective, but there's also like, it's very damaging and dangerous for, for us. Like even from, you know, a financial perspective, like there is no win in having yeah. that kind of content on Absolutely. our site. So like we, we work really, really hard um, to prevent it, not just from our site, but just like in general, like, it should not exist in the world at all, period. Yeah. And that's really interesting that you point them towards a place where, and that there is a foundation that exists yep. that looks to help people with these kinds of dangerous compulsions mm -hmm. rather than just labeling them, you know, a certain thing and then yeah. just like not addressing the problem at all. Because we all know like with the human condition, if you don't try to address the issue mm -hmm. and, and help people mm -hmm. work through it, get past it, whatever it may be, like it doesn't just go away. 
by yeah. like you pretending it doesn't exist and mm-hmm. like turning your head away from it. Like people actively need help yeah. to deal with. And I've read some interest. I read an interesting story um, about how there's been studies around that, like even being like a somewhat genetic situation, mm-hmm. like a genetic compulsion. Like, anyways, it's something I, I, I'm not going to go into here, but yeah. um, really interesting at looking at it in a way of like how can we address this issue in a way that like helps to eliminate it by helping the people yeah. who are dealing with it. Exactly. Like, what is like instead of just demonizing and pathologizing and you know hand wringing and getting really mad about it like what is an actual tangible way right that we can work on talk on tackling this problem right. in a way that's going to show meaningful results and impact right yeah. rather than like pushing these people away yeah. to the fringes of society yeah. and saying like you're we don't want to help you we don't want to talk to you we mm-hmm. don't want to deal with it and then you know they find other ways more damaging ways yeah. to address these compulsions mm-hmm. and um, that's really admirable. Thank you. So um, let's uh, talk about the new legislation that's come up. Mm-hmm. Um, Pornhub has now blocked access to the site in seven states, including Utah, Mississippi, and Texas. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yes. So age verification um, is a spicy topic right now. Um, I was at XBiz in LA earlier this year, and I went to a bunch of different panels. And even if the panel had like less than nothing to do with this subject, it inevitably made its way in, I think, to like all 10 uh, that I attended. It's extremely top of mind for everybody. So basically what's happening um, all over the world, but especially in the U.S. right now, in the U.S., it's um, it's a little bit different because it's happening on a state by state level. Um, There are basically copycat versions of the same really bad law (laughs) that are being um, introduced in different states and in some cases have already gone into effect, like in those states that you just mentioned where we've blocked. Um, So the reason why we decided to block in those states, it's still in compliance with the law. So I just want to be really clear with that, that when we're stopping service in those states, we're still complying because literally no one um, can access the site if they age verify or not. But basically, the way that these laws are currently designed is they're asking people to do age verification through a third party. Um, So essentially what you would have to do if you want to go on a porn site is provide your ID um, and get that ID approved. In some cases, you don't know what is happening with that data. um, And only once you do that can you get into the site. So on the surface level, a lot of people think like, oh, this is great. Like they're, you know, they're trying to like these laws make total sense because they're trying to protect kids. Right. But what we're seeing, actually, there's a number of flaws in the way that these um, laws have been crafted. So for one, um, what we've seen in Louisiana, for instance, Louisiana was the first state um, a little over a year ago that we saw this type of legislation go into effect. So we decided there, like, OK, we're going to comply in the way that the law is written. It was um, a little bit different there too, because they have a product that's called LA Wallet, um, which as far as we understand is kind of like widely used in the state already. Like it already has a lot of people using it. Like I think you can use it to like show ID to get into a bar or to whatever, like that kind of thing. Um, So we were thinking like, okay, this could be, maybe this could work because a lot of people already have it. But um, interestingly, we saw in fact, once the law went into effect and once we introduced um, age verification there is we saw our traffic actually dipped by 80%. So we know that that huge number of people, that 80% of people did not just stop watching porn overnight. Um, What it's doing is they're going to other sites. And what's really dangerous about that is that um, there's not really enforcement that's happening, right? So there's these huge risks, there's these huge not risks, but like you're you're liable for potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're not complying with these laws and it racks up very quickly. Um, you're at risk of getting sued essentially if you're not introducing the the age gating. And but a lot, most sites are just not complying because there's no one that's going after them. So we're you know there we we introduced it, but we saw that the vast majority of sites are not. And unfortunately, most sites um, or many other sites I shouldn't say most sites, but 
a lot of other porn sites that are out there and that's hundreds of thousands, right? I don't think people understand like how vast um, that number is, do not have, you know, anywhere near sort of like the safety uh, or the trust and safety sort of stuff set up in the same way that we do. So they're not moderating content. Um, there's no like banned stuff. Like there's like, it's kind of, you know, wild west on a lot of these sites. So essentially what's happening is traffic is getting rerouted to sketchy sites. Um, it's putting everyone at risk. And there's also like really serious privacy um, concerns, I think there, where there's, um, you know, these products that we as providers um, are not necessarily at liberty to choose, like which ones we do and don't do business with. Like the way that it works is um, states will kind of mandate which ones they're deeming as acceptable, or in some cases, completely vague. And we have no idea which ones we could or couldn't use. And it's kind of just like this mysterious guessing game, which is really fun. Um, and there's huge potential for data breaches, right? Um, let alone just like the thought of someone going to like, I, I super understand like why someone going to a porn site is not like, here, take my passport, here, take my driver's license, here, take my, you know, government issue ID. Um, and you don't really know where that data is going. And, you know, um, we also don't want really to encourage that practice of people just handing over um, sensitive information, not even just to an adult site, but just like anywhere online. Like that's just like not generally a good thing to get into the habit of doing. Um, it's so crazy. Cause, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt yeah, you yeah, for totally. one second because I'm thinking about the 2257 law and when that yeah. was enacted many years ago, mm -hmm. like back in my early days in porn mm -hmm. and people were like, so this was the, this was like an age verification process, but it was where the law insisted that producers take the personal age verification and sensitive information from performers and keep it on file like for all time in case the FBI decided to like raid your offices mm -hmm. and, and look for it, which of course we complied with and we still do to this day. And I remember my father specifically being very concerned about this because yeah. he was like, now these people have to give us their private information that we have to keep on record mm -hmm. and they have to trust that we're going to keep it in a secure place mm -hmm. and that like other people are not going to be able to access mm -hmm. it. And you're talking about like every porn performer, I mean, every porn producer yeah. company in the world. And what we've seen is tons of data breaches. I mean, performers addresses getting out there. Performers, I mean, I know I remember one friend of mine specifically, like, so one of the things that um, we have to do are the bunny ears, right? Where the performer holds the IDs up to their face when, mm -hmm. they, when they take a photo. Mm -hmm. Well, there was this one company, very sloppy, obviously, took that picture at the end of like a roll of film that they shot on them for the website, didn't edit the roll of film oh, no. and published every picture, including her with her IDs on oh, the Oh my internet. God. And shit like that has happened many times over. That's terrifying. You know? And I mean, you can't rely, look, there's like sloppy producers that have stuff in unsecured and performers have to come into the industry now. I mean, this is a lot, like yeah. there's no way around it now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can do about it. And they have to give over sensitive private information to all kinds of people. Yeah. And there's, they have no control over what happens with that in the end. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And it's just like, I mean, this is, um, this is different because it would be, I know that with 2257s, a lot of it, um, or now I guess it's more digitized, but yeah, it's like, it, de it definitely poses um, a really big concern, I think, mm -hmm. on just like a privacy level for yeah. sure. I think it's worse for users though, right? Because it's like, these are people that are not necessarily putting their face out there and entering the porn industry, right? Mm -hmm. Like performers like understand they take a certain risk, like their name, their face is on there and stuff. Well, we saw what happened with Ashley Madison, right? Yeah. Like, perfect example <laughs> yeah. of like why that would be a very understandable concern, concern yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's something that um, we're very concerned about, obviously. And the reason why we blocked is just because, you know, we, we cannot in good faith um, participate in that way. So we're still, we're still complying. Um, like I said, where by just not having access at all, there's compliance to the law. So we're not um, at risk on that front, but we just cannot encourage people um, 
to hand over their sensitive information yeah. to an unvetted third party that yeah. could. And we're absolutely in favor of the concept of age verification. Like I said, like we do think that like our platforms are we you know, we've gone to great lengths, I think, to make sure that our platforms are really accessible only to people over the age of 18. We are RTA compliant. Um, it's really effective when parental controls are enacted properly on devices. And that will bring me to my next point, um, which is that we really do think there is an effective solution that exists at the device level. And that's a concept that we're more and more trying to socialize within the industry and help people understand um, that this is kind of, you know, a way that we could be um, addressing the issue of making sure that kids are not accessing all kinds of age inappropriate content, right? That's not just limited to adult, that's also dating sites. Um, it's anything to do with alcohol consumption, like violent content, um, gaming. There's a whole number of things that really are reserved for adult audiences only. Um, so at the device level, basically the really like simplified version of it is that it would be like if you have um, your Apple ID, right? If you have an iPhone, there would be a step that would get introduced where you would go through the process of verifying um, your identity just once, right? You would do it. It would be part of kind of like your user ID as someone that is operating that device. And then that way it's, it's done one time. And if it's a device that's being handed to a kid, there would be no age verification that happens, right? So um, basically it would remain, it would be kind of like the way that we talk about it is that it's like the opt in or opt out, depending on how you're looking at it. So um, when you have the device, automatically it's, there's no age verification that's done, right? So only when an adult takes it and is like, okay, yeah, I do want to, you know, download a dating platform or like a dating site, or I do want to access adult content, or I do want to go on gaming platforms, then you would say, okay, I'm going to go and verify myself as being an adult. And then it just kind of, it's, it's very similar, I guess, the way that you would experience, um, you know, being online on your device today, it would just kind of ungate everything. But for a kid, it would be the opposite where all these things would similarly be restricted. Mm -hmm. So it's like a much more effective solution because you're only doing it once. And it's, you know, it's um, already kind of part of human nature. Like, I don't know about you, but like my Apple ID has like all my credit cards link to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's got like my insurance information for my car. Like we're, we're, we're used to that. Um, and we can trust, you know, obviously no system is 1000 million percent perfect, but for the most part, like we can trust that those operating systems are frequently doing security updates. They're anticipating these things. They're built for that in a way that like random kind of third party providers that are in many cases just emerging now on the market because they're seeing the opportunity they're just not built in the same way. So we, I, I don't think that personally we could hold them necessarily to the same standards um, in terms of keeping that information safe. Do you think Apple would be open to that? I hope so. <laughs> I will also uh, <laughs> point you guys towards a PSA video that I did about how to take your device and use it to prevent children from accessing porn on it. So um, check it out. It's I think it's literally the title is like how to stop your children from accessing porn or something but it's a PSA that I did and it's it's on my channel and it's like actually shockingly easy to do mm -hmm. and something that I didn't even know I mean I'm a mom but she's also three so like you know she's not going on the um on my phone without me there though yeah, for she's sure. getting shockingly good at <laughs> operating that 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 device yikes uh but yeah so there there are ways there are things in place now that you can do to protect your kids from accessing porn on any device that you give them. But it does require you to be proactive as a parent. So, mm -hmm. but it's not hard to do. So look into it. I will share that too. I'm going to get that from you um, after we're done this. Cause yeah. I think, yeah, like that's also part of it also is just like, like just talking about it, I think, which sounds like so simple almost, but I think that the more um, that, we're kind of socializing this concept and just like making it okay to talk about the fact mm -hmm. that like, yeah, sometimes, you know, like the internet is like a vast place and um, technology is constantly sort of evolving in ways that like, obviously, you know, especially as parents, you can't anticipate. Mm -hmm. So it is important to talk about like, okay, like, yeah, if I'm going to give my kid an iPhone, I have to understand that 
there might be things out there that I don't want them to see, but there are tools that are available to prevent them from yeah. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel there's a, there's a shocking lack of um, information out there for parents. On I that. agree. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like, like we just, we don't talk about it. Like, you yeah. know, it's, it's more common to rail against the companies, rail against porn in general, rather than like seek out solutions to, you know, taking responsibility mm -hmm. for what your kids are viewing. Yeah, because I mean, I understand, right? Like the the appeal of wanting your kid to have a phone so that you can be able to reach them like at any time and so that they can reach you if there's an emergency. But I think it's just like, OK, what are the other implications of that? And how can we do this in a way that's keeping everybody safe? I think there's also like what they, I don't know what they're called. My husband calls them dumb phones. Mm. But I think there are phones that you can get for kids that are literally like so limited. They can only like place calls, um, receive calls, place mm -hmm. text messages, receive messages, mm -hmm. maybe access limited apps or something like okay. that. But like it's basically, you know, like you can't literally just jump online on your phone. Okay. Because, you know, another thing of course, is like kids are smart, first of all. They're gonna find they're gonna find ways, right? Yeah. And also like you can't control like what your kids' friends have. Mm -hmm. Um so I kind of wish I saw more of those, you know, like totally. kid phones. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is it's fortunately an issue I don't need to deal with yet. <laughs> but once I get to that point, it's fine. We'll just all have computer chips implanted into our brains. Yeah, so exactly. It won't be you know, it'll be something different. <laughs> um, so it's been one year since MindGeek was purchased by Ethical Capital Partners. Yep. What changes have been made to Pornhub that impact both performers and fans? That's a good one. Um, I think the big one is is transparency for sure. I think that that one um, really goes a long way. Like I, I have, uh, colleagues on the ECP team, ethical capital partners, sorry, I should not again with the acronyms, um, that also are public facing. And we often actually do interviews together, which I really like, because I think that we're able to bring kind of experience and visibility from both sides, um, of the comp or the respective companies, I guess. Um, I'm more direct facing with, um, with the industry itself, I guess, like mm -hmm. with, performers. Um, so that's more like my area of expertise, I guess. But that I think is really, really important is that there's people that are able and willing to show their faces, give their names and, you know, represent the industry in, you know, from our side of it, but also to to advocate for certain things and to help hopefully make certain things better. Um, that's a big part of what we're trying to do right now with the age verification laws. Like it's not just um, a business thing for us, obviously, like we do really see that there are very big implications here, uh, for performers as well, because, you know, we, we understand that when, for instance, like when we're blocking traffic in certain States, um, obviously, yes, there's implications for us on a business level, but that's also, um, unfortunately also impacting the way that content is visible for performers as well. Like I mentioned that, um, it's, it's view-based, right? So if someone, for instance, Texas, where we recently blocked, if your huge following is there, like that is impacting people's bottom line. It is not a decision that we took lightly. It is not the decision that we wanted to make. Um, but that's why like we really do see it as our responsibility, both from the ALO and ECP sides to be kind of like leading um, in this in this way. Mm -hmm. How has the model program strengthened the relationship between Pornhub and creators? Um, I think right now we have a really great team in place um santa who i work with really closely on that front has been really incredible at um directly interfacing i think with a lot of creators and then also her team as well so it's you know sure it's sometimes doing like more of like tech focused solves for people but also um one of the things that i think really sets us apart compared to other creator platforms is that we do have like a accessible human team um that people can reach out to when they have issues like i've heard oh unlike fucking youtube or fucking instagram or facebook who's still holding on to my bonuses from a year ago oh no <laughs> they owe me like 2500 dollars that like we cannot get that is insane it's insane i That's can't so frustrating. I, I can't talk to a real person so if anybody is listening to this who works at facebook Y'all owe me twenty four hundred dollars. Twenty three hundred. 
Oh, 3,300? No, even even more? more? Wow. Yeah, fuck you guys. Awful. Call me. Because, like, give me I, my money. Please. Like, I get it, right? Like, I understand that with volume, like, sure, AI is a great tool sometimes when you're just trying to, like, move people through mm-hmm. and access, like, answer, like, how do I change my password? Blah, blah, fine. But, like, when you're talking about people's livelihoods and and somebody who's like yes, i mean like we yes. get a lot of fucking views like yes. we're up there and i have email we've done like everything i mean masha's been like on top of this like i think i don't know no it's I think so we recently it's crazy it's really awful. it's like really there's not one person who can talk to me like i'm like i send you like i bring in a lot of fucking traffic for yeah I be- exactly so like and we we take that really seriously and you know, sometimes like we deal with higher levels of volume than than we'd like. And so there is like backlog for a couple of yeah. days, but which I understand is also super frustrating. Not like two fucking years. No, no. And that's the thing is that like we will there are human beings that are answering these things. And sometimes that even means like getting on a Zoom call, getting on a phone call. Like that is something that I'm so proud of with that team is mm-hmm. that like there is that level of, of access um, that I really wish that other platforms also did Mm -hmm. yeah so actually a question for you on that front Mm -hmm. so i get a lot of people who reach out to me about like how do i get into the porn industry how do i dip my toe in a lot of it is how do i start an OnlyFans Mm -hmm. or whatever and i often refer back to pornhub just because you guys have so much fucking traffic Mm -hmm. and it's a great place for a creator to start to start uploading videos and start to get that fan base so could you give us like maybe um a good it doesn't have to be super specific, mm-hmm. but for someone who's I'm a guy or I'm a girl, I don't know. I want to get into the porn industry. Pornhub might be a good place for me to start. Can you tell me how I would do that? I would say check out our blog. Um, the Pornhub blog is a great resource. It's really crafted with um, the creator in mind. Like most of the stuff that's there is really more like industry facing than kind of like civilian facing, I guess. Um So there are a lot of really great pointers there on how to make content that is going to be more successful. But there's also stuff like make sure that you're really thinking about this. Yeah. Make sure that you're you're really ready for this. I have I have not unwillingly, but I have talked people out of. Yeah, but I think that that's important to do. Yeah. Right. Like, and I know that that goes against like what I think a lot of people think that the nature of the industry is right, where it's like, oh, we're just trying to like lure as many people in as possible, and it's like. No, like this, I really do think that people need to understand. And that's like one of the things that I find so frustrating, like that we saw, especially I think coming out of the pandemic where people are like, oh, whatever, like I don't feel like doing this job anymore. So like I'm just going to do an OnlyFans because it's so easy. And it's just like, no, it is actually really hard work um, to succeed and to to do well in this industry because it's not just like, okay, I'm going to take my clothes off and like put it online and just hope for the best. It's like, there's so much. I mean, you know this that yeah. goes into it. Like you have to, in many cases, like you have to be like your own like marketing executive, your own editor, your own lighting specialist, your own stylist. There's a number of different your things. Own you need. bookkeeper. Yeah. Your own. I mean, like the list is extensive. I mean, porn is really full of entrepreneurs. Yeah, and very a bunch smart of people. Small businesses, mm-hmm. and it is. Yeah, it is not like a job. You know. You don't get to show up to work, clock in, clock out, and then everything's taken care yep. of for you. Like you literally like you want to run your own business. Like it's a job. It is. But it also there's a great community that can be found. Yeah. A um, lot of help. Yes. There's like so many like yes. other sex workers who are so happy to help yeah. new sex workers. I mean, myself like included, you know, mm-hmm. especially when women reach out to me because, yes. you know, they tend to fall into the bad, bad hands, the most frequently I'm always like willing to give advice and mm-hmm. suggestions and ideas because I just don't want people to like if you really want to do this if you've thought about it yeah. and you recognize that everybody's going to find out what you do for a living mm-hmm. um, and you know it's something that you want to do and you don't mind this following you around for the rest of your life and yeah. you're not thinking about running for president later though then again I mean hey. who knows hey. apparently anybody can be president <laughs> these days but um, then you know I want to like help people find the right resources yeah. and and dip their toe in slowly. Start For somewhere sure. where you're creating your own content that you have control over yes. and and see how you feel about it mm-hmm. before you like sign over your likeness and your rights to 
a company, honestly. Yeah, for sure. I think um, there's some great resources on the blog. There's also the Sexual Wellness Center on Pornhub that has some stuff um, on that level as well. So that's like a completely separate resource. It lives on Pornhub. So it's at pornhub.com slash sex. Um, and that's basically a whole myriad of articles on everything to do with sexual wellness, mm -hmm. which we include, you know, performing as part of that. There's um, resources there that we did in partnership with uh, Pineapple Support. So we have a bunch of their stuff from different summits that they've done. Um, for those of you who don't know, Pineapple Support is an organization created for the mental health support for yeah. adult performers. Yes, and they're great. And we also have uh, resources that we're in the process of creating with them. Um, it's very similar to what we're doing with Cupcake Girls, but like you said, through a mental health lens. Um, so yeah, I think that like those are two really good places to start. But I think, um, like you said, Pornhub is a great place for creators to build their brand. So like we we never pretend that like we are kind of like the be all end all for anyone as far as like where they're making money in porn. Like I think that for most creators, um, there's like very different and, and various um, revenue streams. But Pornhub is a great one because you can get the um, the views, you can get like the the uh, revenue share from the views. But then also we let you um, link out to your other platforms. So it's kind of like a great, oh, that's great. It's like a real hub. Oh, wow. Because there's a lot of platforms that won't let you do that. I know. And boy, we, oh, boy. We're not one of them. Don't we're... you try to mention another brand. On... I actually posted something on Loyal Fans. Mm -hmm. And I and it, browsers had sent me a bunch of stuff. And it was like just the try on haul, the same thing that I put on yeah, yeah. YouTube, you know, mm -hmm. totally safe for work. Mm -hmm. And they, they fucking start out browsers. And I was like, really? Oh, oh. No. No, we, yeah, you can plug. I mean, obviously it has to be um, a compliant site. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It, it can't just be like anything, but yeah. you can link out. Yeah, you can link to any of your fan sites. You can link out to your own website. You can put your link tree, like your, I think you can even put your Amazon wish list on there. Like there's like a whole, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, love I think that. it's it's really smart for that reason. And it's like a great place to just like engage with fans too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about something fun for a moment. Yeah. The Pornhub Awards are coming yeah. up. They're on Thursday. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going. The, the theme is leather and lace. Yeah. I did rent myself a leather dress. Let's hope it fits. Ooh, I'm excited to see. Yeah, yeah. me too. So I've that's, been... Yeah, that's like the rough guideline for the, the look inspo. I don't have lace, though. I don't know what I'm going to do about that. It's fine. You don't. It's kind of just like we're doing it at the Whiskey A Go Go. Right. So we're trying to, like, encourage people to lean in. Yeah. The theme. So this is very different. It's funny because every year you guys have had a completely different iteration yep. of the Porn of Awards. hundred percent the truth. Yeah. Last year it was at um that one house that like everybody shoots at. The um, Jimmy Goldstein residence. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when like Ryan sent me the info, it was like, There's no parking, take a ride share. I was like, Yeah. No. Oh, and it I starts know. at eleven PM or something. I was like, Dad. I know. I can't, I can't do that. Like, I, I'm so old. I go to bed at 9. Um, this one starts at 9.30, so I feel like I can make it. Um, so, and then there was, like, you guys, like, announced the winners online. But this mm -hmm. year, they're going up on stage It's now? hybrid. It's hybrid. Okay. So, um, we are still going to do um, the announcement video, which is going to have all the, the winners um, from the different categories that are going to be announced. And that one, we're going to air at the awards we're going to do a couple on stage um but we're trying to like yeah to your point like we we kind of like keep it exciting and and don't ever follow the same exact formula year after year are you guys um, like looking for a formula that works for you guys are you guys just like we're, we're going gonna to try feedback. something different yeah, okay like i think that the first two were kind of more traditional awards shows mm -hmm. and they were fun but they were really long mm -hmm. they were like three and a half hours each mm -hmm. time and was the red carpet a shit show? Because the red carpet's always a shit show. Honestly, in every single award ceremony. I don't even remember because the first one was in 2018. That was like the famous Kanye one. Oh, um, right. <laughs> we, like, come on, like, literally, like, three days before. It was 10. But ah. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was a, a very radical change in direction, but yeah. um, very, it was very exciting. And um, then the year after, we had um, that was the year that like Bad Bunny performed and Caliucci's and I forget who else. It was like yeah, so those two were like the more I guess like conventional mm -hmm. type of award shows. But what we saw is that like a lot of the time people are kind of just like 
at the bar hanging out. Like they weren't sitting there. And so we're like, okay, it's really fun to sort of get everybody together. I think it's really important to celebrate the achievements of the community because we um, we're different from other award shows. It's all data driven, right? So like people that are winning in their respective categories, like it's because they're the ones that are getting like viewed the most or engaged with the most. Like there's, it's it's not just like a group of people that just like decide like she's top p- female or this is top trans performer or whatever. Right. Um, it's not a company that you have to pay off to get your awards. No, you can't if you tried. Mm. You could not. Um, Interesting. What a concept. Pornhub awards cannot be bought. Mm. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we we don't want to undermine that, um, but we, yeah, so we're trying, we're going to try it out this year, see how people like this format. I think it's a great um, in-between where we will have like those moments of recognition on stage. I have to give a speech, which I'm like slightly terrified to do, but going to gonna do it. Uh, we're going to be announcing a new Pornhub brand ambassador. Spoiler Ooh. alert. Yeah, I won't say who, but um I'm really excited about that. So that's going to happen on stage as well. But for the most part, like we just saw that people want to party. Like they want to, like, it's so nice just to get everybody together and they get all dressed up. And it's like, we want it to feel celebratory, but not just like, okay, you're sitting through a several hours long show. Some really terrible writing, bad comedy. I've, I've seen, I've seen some bad stuff. But I also I appreciate that it's it's not, not an not easy thing to do. Not talking about expos, by the way. <clears throat> expos is always excluded from all of my criticisms <laughs> because I love expos. But it's yeah, it's like it's hard <laughs> it's it's hard to write a script for an award show. It and really like, is. I mean, I say this as somebody who's a terrible fucking writer. I'm trying to write my own porn scripts, and I am not good. <laughs> let's just let's just be clear. Well, it's because like we've worked on it. Like I can't like because people also just want to give like the easy like digs you know what I mean and it's just like no I know like to you this is so funny but like this is actually really serious and these are big achievements and these are huge accomplishments in our industry and we are trying to make people feel celebrated as such so can we not just like make a bunch of like stupid cum jokes like there's a time and a place for those but like it is not with this so yeah yeah. I mean especially in a world where like people are just are constantly being put down for what they do for a living it's nice to go to a place where you're celebrated a hundred percent yeah. Totally. I love that. Well, I'm excited to see how it goes. Me too. Is there anything else that you want to let people know about Pornhub and the direction that they're going in that we haven't covered? Um, I would like to shamelessly plug my own podcast if I, if I may. Um, which you've been a guest on and will be coming out in the next season. Oh my god, no, it'll be wait. the best episode of your season. No, honestly, for sure. I I loved the interview that we did. Like when we were That's all good. I totally don't remember it. <laughs> it was, like, it was like, no, it was, it was like so good. It was with it was you and your mom, and it was like we covered a lot of ground. Um yeah. I still have to we did it months ago. I have to actually listen to the latest edit, but um yeah, it's called Terms of Service. Mm-hmm. Um, it's If you're subscribing already to the Pornhub podcast, you can get it there, but it's available on all of the um, places that you listen to podcasts. Can you please tell everybody where they can find you online? I know, obviously, Terms of Service yeah. out on all podcast platforms, but uh, any other socials? Uh, Twitter um, is just at Pornhub, and then I have my own Instagram, which is my name. It's Alex Kekesi, so A-L-E-X-K-E-K-E-S-I. Perfect. Yep. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on um, Instagram and on Twitter. I also have a Pornhub account uh, too, by the way, where I post some of my content and actually some of my podcasts as well. So you can you can find me on Pornhub as well. Um, and of course, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered to get access to these live streams and other bonus content. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next week. <laughs>